to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth, which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints, and you continue to minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Now, it's quite obvious that the context before us is dealing with a truth that is very familiar to the Jews, and that is the context of the high priest and the worship of the Old Testament and the ministry of a high priest in behalf of Israel. And in this passage, we have been introduced to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, has become a high priest. He is superior, if you please, to the priesthood of that in the Old Testament of Aaron, the high priest. Now, we've had the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ brought to our attention in a number of ways now. He is the one that's the superior, that through him is the superior revelation. He is the superior revealer. He's superior to the angels. He's superior to Moses. And now, here's a passage whereby we find him superior to the high priest of Israel. And so we are building quite a case for the recipients of this letter as far as the Jews are concerned. Now get your eyes focused upon one who's superior in so many ways to that Judaistic religion which you have had in days past. In fact, the one that we present to you in this particular portion, he states, is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is a priest that is a um, a priest, and a king priest, king of Salem, king of peace, and etc. And the one that we're talking about is a priest, as verse 10 says, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now isn't it quite obvious to us that the context before us is that which is built strongly upon Jewish ground. And if we're going to understand the passage before us, we must remember this because there's some very, very severe warnings. So many times when you come to Hebrews chapter 6, it's taken completely out of its context and consequently is not properly understood, we feel. Now then in verses 11 through 14, with reference to this warning of degeneration, we have the problem presented. Now this problem presented in these uh, few verses is a, a, a wonderful revelation because the problem is pinpointed in absolute accuracy, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing your dull of hearing. Now then, of uh, what's this referred to? Well, Christ, after the order of Melchizedek, and we have many things to say to you in this regard. But there's a problem here. The problem is that you are dull of hearing, and the Greek word here is nothroi. Nothroth, which is plural, and it simply means this. You're sluggish. You are those that are uh, dull of hearing in that you are very sluggish. You, you're spiritually sluggish. You're not able to take it. And then he uh, uh, brings a harsh criticism upon them because of this condition. And uh, he states here in verse 12, For when for the time you ought to be teachers... You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And this term, first principles, is that which relates to the rudiments. And what, is, what do we mean by the rudiments? Now, uh, years and years ago, <coughs> not so much today, we don't use it, but in uh, the elementary schools and the teaching years ago, there was that which, uh, was, no, uh, which was referred to as, well, they're being taught the rudiments. Oh, what do you mean the rudiments? The rudiments of uh, mathematics, and the rudiments of spelling, the rudiments of English. 
That happens to be the basic things. Isn't that right? The beginning, the basic things. Well, now, if you have a, a spiritual condition, you're very sluggish with reference to your spiritual condition. And uh, this is uh, lamentable because a time period has elapsed to such a degree that you ought to be those who are teachers uh, with reference to the Word of God. But uh, because of your spiritual condition, why, you simply have to have someone go back to the basics again, the basics of the Word of God. Now then, what do you suppose the context is dealing with? Well, isn't it dealing with the, with the basics as far as the Jewish people understand uh, concerning those things prophesied, uh, those things which look forward to the one that's going to come on the scene as a priest after the order of Melchizedek? I believe so, because we're going to note this a little bit later. And you're become such as have meat of milk and not a strong meat. Now, there's nothing wrong with the diet of milk. In fact, milk is good food, spiritually speaking. But the problem is simply this, that after a person has been on the spiritual Bible long enough, he ought to be getting into solid foods uh, spiritually. He ought to be growing up. So there's nothing wrong with the diet of milk. What is wrong is that the maturity, spiritual maturity of such an individual hasn't uh, uh, appropriated that diet and whereby that he's grown to grow out of it. And that now he, he gives us a characteristic of their babyhood spiritual condition in the next verse. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. In other words, you, you are those that have need of milk. Milk relates to those who are babies. Babies are those who have a particular relationship to the Word of God, which is characterized by being unskillful in the Word of the Lord. Now then, this word babe here is napios, which uh, relates to a bona fide baby. So I think at this point, we can simply state that he is speaking to Jewish people that from his point of view, in all probability, they are those that are professing uh, believers in Judaism, but their spiritual condition is of such a nature that is lamentable. And he goes on and states, now in quite contrast, strong meat belongs to those who are of full age. Now this word full age is helios. Now I'm giving you these words because there's a bearing upon them in the context which follows. And the word teleos here, uh, full age, looks at that which is a point of maturity. Have come ha, an individual who has come to the place of maturity, and that maturity is manifested by virtue of the diet that he's able to partake of, and that is a full uh, course meal, so to speak. Even those now who by reason of use have their senses exercised to be able to discern both good and evil. Now then, it is wonderful to note the characteristic of one who's mature. One who's spiritually mature is one that's got some discernment. And one that has some discernment is one that's able to discern between those things which are right and those things which are wrong. Now, it's lamentable that we, by application, are living in an age, as far as Christendom is concerned, that has very, very few people that have discernment who is able to discern between those things which are right and those things which are wrong. And I'm saying this, that it uh, is characterized not only by those that we would call the laity, but it's certainly characterized by many who are supposed to be the preachers and teachers uh, of the word of the Lord. And uh, they... Uh, are not able to discern because if they were able to discern their actions would manifest it and if their actions don't manifest it then they're either babes or they are those that are able to know it and simply turn their back upon it which of course for him to know to do good and do it not to him it is sin and consequently they are living frankly in the ministry of sin when they know what is right and they fail to do it 
Now, those are strong words, aren't they? But they're just as true as true can be. And we just as well be confronted uh, in our lives uh, with these facts because we're living in this age and in this day where it seems as though everything goes. Now, that's not the case. God says absolutely not. If you're going to be spiritually mature, you're going to manifest that maturity by virtue of the way that you're going to handle the Word of God and then the way that you're going to practice the Word of God. And that's it in a nutshell. So we have to simply be confronted by the Spirit of God. How do we stand? Are we those that are classified in verses 11 through 14 by application like those who had uh, made profession in Judaism and yet uh, they are sluggish of hearing because they are unskillful in the word of righteousness? Now, you can be your own judge on that, can't you? I certainly have to be the, the, my own judge on it. And I know there's many things that I do not know about the word of God as yet. But it's this very thing right here that simply impelled me and compelled me to set my life apart to the study of the word of the Lord whereby I could get just as good of tools as I possibly could to be able to handle the word of the Lord. Because the one who dares handle the word of God, he comes under uh, a severe surveillance of, the, of our wonderful God. And remember now, you Sunday school teachers and anyone else who would like to be engaged in being a teacher of the word of the Lord, there's simply greater judgment that rests upon you if you do not handle the word of God aright. And yet it's a high and holy calling to be entrusted with the word of the Lord. And this is one of the things, maybe I've told you about my experience, not only, now my experience doesn't uh, uh, help the interpretation of the passage at all, but it just might enlighten you to some of the things which I've had to do. As I told you last night with reference to when I got out of college, what I had to do with the word of the Lord, but we had what we call was a, a senior sneak uh, in, in uh, college. And the whole senior class, as uh, they do once a year, they try to get off by themselves without any of the underclassmen knowing where they're going. And, and this is a big hush-hush secret uh, kind of deal. And uh, have a sponsor. And we get off for a couple of three days of a real time of spiritual retreat. And I remember one of the boys ministering that night in the little lodge that we had obtained for the senior snake, and he uh, spoke in this passages, passage of scripture, that which characterizes a baby. One who's unskilled, unskillful in the word of, of righteousness. And I had to be honest with myself. I was unskillful in the word of righteousness. And I lament the fact that in many cases I'm unskillful with many things concerning the word of the Lord yet. But I am grateful for what he has given me. And uh, I want to live whereunto I have attained. I trust you'll pray for me in this regard. But the condition and the problem before us here as we come to Hebrews chapter 6 is a group of people that are called babies. They're a group of people who are sluggish because they are babies. And they're not able to partake of the meat of the word of the Lord. You're not able to partake of that revelation that Christ is your high priest after the order of Melchizedek. All right, now then, there's a great plea set before us in verses 1 and 2. You've had the problem in verse 11 through 14. Now the plea in verses 1 and 2. Therefore, and uh, this is pretty strong, all right, because of this, uh, leave the principles or the beginning of the word of Christ and let us bear on or let us go on unto perfection. Now then, this Greek word perfection here, listen to it, if you will, and teletetos, teletetos. Now then, you remember me giving you the word in verse 14 where it says full age, teleos, teleos, that which is mature, all right, this Greek word here, teletetos, is a word uh, that has much the same meaning. It is that which brings us to the uh, reality there needs to be completeness. 
Let us go on unto completeness. Now this has been a word that's been debated time and time again as to what is meant as far as Hebrews chapter 6 is concerned. Now I might present to you something tonight that you will disagree with, but uh, that's all right. Uh, uh, at least I hope that I can give you uh, something to whet your appetite on and possibly do a little bit of uh, digging. Notice the background again. Ju Judaistic professors in Christ. That is basically what we have. Now then we're going to find out that the author is persuaded a little bit later that these individuals that he's speaking to are those that are right with God, those things that accompany salvation. He's persuaded of that. But nevertheless, there may be many who by virtue of their profession, it just isn't real. All right, now I'm going to suggest for you that this word teletetos, and this is a very, very uh, uh, dangerous suggestion in the light of the hermeneutical principle that there is one and only one interpretation of Scripture. Now, I'm going to state this, that this word perfection does have the one and only one significant meaning. And that significant meaning is simply this. Absolute completeness. Completeness. Did you hear me? Let us go on unto completeness. Now we're going to have problems with reference to the context as to what the completeness means. But nevertheless, the word does mean coming unto completeness. Now, I'm going to suggest this to you, that this word completeness may have, and I believe does have within its context, a twofold significant approach. I believe it may relate to having Completeness with reference to one's standing. Secondly, it may and does, I believe, have the significant meaning of one's condition. But both of them are true. Basically, in light of the term teletetos. Come to completeness. All right, now then, maybe this will open up a little bit better for you as we go on. All right, now, for this cause, leave the beginnings, the beginnings of the doctrine of Christ. Well, what are the beginnings of the doctrine of Christ? Well, we're going to talk about them now. But we're going to talk, but please remember, he's speaking to the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, that have got a background, isn't that right? that a background, their Old Testament scriptures are prophesying about Messiah. And he says now, leave the beginnings of the doctrine of Messiah. Because that's exactly what Christ means. All you have to do is turn over to John chapter 1 and get the inspired interpretation of what Christos is. And uh, <clears throat> where they say, well, we found the Christ, which by interpretation is Messiah. Or we found the Messiah, which by interpretation is Christos the Christ. Now then, now let us leave the beginning, uh, beginning of this part uh, of Christ. After all, he stated back here in verse 12, you constantly have to have need that one teach you the rudiments or the basics of the Word of God, the oracles of God. Now then, he sort of uh, zeroes in on them and uh, crystallizes what are some of these things, the beginnings of the doctrine, the teaching of Messiah, so let us go on now unto perfection. Let us go on now unto completeness. Not now laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of washing, and laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Now everything that's mentioned with reference to these, I believe, six or seven terms here, every one of these doctrines are found in the Old Testament. Every single one of them. Now then, they are uh, doctrinal truths that point to 
Messiah with reference to religious worship in some way. All right? Leave these basic things and go on into completeness. Now notice something. If there's going to be a going on into this completeness, in verse 3, God lays down the prerequisites for this going on. Now get this carefully because it's a wonderful progression of thought. First, the problem. Secondly, the plea. And now God's prerequisites. And this will we do. If God permit. All right. What are the things that God will or God won't permit as far as going on into completeness? In verses 4 through 6, we are introduced to a passage which is really a problem passage, but dealing with the peril of not appropriating the proper prerequisites of God. Here in verse 4, 5, and 6 are three verses that God absolutely lays down. He will not permit one to go on unto completeness if 4, 5, and 6 are true. Watch it now. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come, or the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to open shade. Now then, I suppose that you can get almost as many interpretations as commentaries that you want to pick up to read on this passage. And I'm going to try to give you what I believe to be the biblical meaning in light of the context which we've laid down, which is before us. Now you will notice, as far as verse 4 is concerned, you will see, for it is impossible. It is impossible. Now that word impossible goes with the condition of verse 6. It is impossible for those if they shall fall away. Impossible for those that have partaken of these things in verse 4 and 5, if they fall away from them, to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Now let's observe uh, what takes place with reference to such a terrible, terrible uh, condition and problem which we have before us where there's an impossibility to renew them again if they fall away. All right, what is it? First of all, those who were once enlightened, those to whom the truth has come, all right, and you've tasted of the heavenly gift. In other words, you have partaken, if you please. It's, it's a real taste of, uh, of uh, appropriating in a real sense uh, heavenly manner. Thirdly, and you become partakers or companions here of the Holy Spirit. And you've tasted the good word of God. And you've tasted of the powers of the coming age. The age to come. Actually, the age which has been introduced by virtue of these powers, this coming age which is upon the scene. After all, what have they been introduced to? Have they been introduced to Christ as a uh, high priest after the order of Melchizedek? Now they're to leave certain things, and they're to go on into completeness. And here they have, we are told right here in this sixth chapter, that there are a number of things that have been brought to their attention. And they've uh, been partakers of, after all, this is going on down uh, the ways, uh, well, chronologically, and uh, the Lord has ministered, and uh, uh, some of the disciples have ministered, and uh, you're enlightened as to who Christ is, and you've tasted of uh, uh, many proofs concerning this wonderful, uh, uh, shall we say, life that's in Christ. Uh, you've gone along with the ministry of God the Holy Spirit in a real sense. 
You have actually partaken, uh, tasted in a real sense, the good word of God concerning the Messiah. And you have tasted of the powers, the various demonstrations of the miracles and etc. of this age that's coming. Now then, for such an individual, if he falls away from it, and this word fall is an aorist participle, and the aorist tense looks at an act which once for all takes place. All of these things being true, and having fallen away from them, terrible fall. Now I'd like to suggest for you a couple of illustrations that might help us. You can take one classic example that's been true of everything that's mentioned here. And we'll all have to admit that Judas is one that certainly was involved in every one of these things that's mentioned here. We certainly qualify in every sense of the word. Then you go on back to Luke chapter 8 where you deal with the various soils. Isn't that right? There are four different kinds of soils. And every one of those soils in some way, somehow, uh, partakes of these things. But there's only one that brings forth fruit on the life. Only one. Only one that has life manifest in a sense of fruit. All right, now then, I believe what we have here is someone that has fully been informed with reference to Christ, fully been informed as to who he is, and the admonition is simply this. It's a terrible thing. Go on unto completeness in him. And I believe the first emphasis that is laid down in Hebrews chapter 6 is an emphasis, all right, don't lay again these basic things concerning the, uh, Christ from the Old Testament and the shadows and etc. And if you are those who have partaken of these things. Go on into a complete position in Christ whereby you have a right relationship. I believe that to be the first emphasis in light of the context. Now let me state this. It isn't a matter of one being saved and lost. That's not the case at all. It is one who's been fully enlightened, one who has been exposed to the whole truth, and he simply falls away or does not want it. He takes a step away from it. He stands off from it. He falls away from it. Don't want it. Absolutely don't want it. Now, by application, church after church after church, <clears throat> every fundamental church across this land has got someone in this congregation that fills this bill. I haven't been a pastor or a preacher too long, but I've been in the ministry for 20 some odd years now, and I, by as far as I can see, although I'm not the judge, one salvation, I can look back in light of my ministry, and I can see various ones that I feel fit right square into this path. Set under my ministry, been involved in my ministry, and I don't think they're any more saved than the man in the moon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here is one that's had all of these blessed privileges. And what does he do? He falls away, doesn't want it. All right, it's impossible. Impossible. It isn't the matter that he is saved uh, and lost and then saved again. Tells me that this individual here, if they fall away, take that definite step of rejection. All right, to renew them again under repentance, it's impossible. Noticing two things. Seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and they put him to open shame. Now then, these two words, crucify, and put to open shame our present participles. And those present participles indicate for us a mode of life or a manner of life. 
The impossibility does not rest with God. But the impossibility rests with the individual that has been exposed to the truth of God concerning Christ and simply takes a step. No. I don't want it. And their manner of life, now listen to this. Their manner of life is of the present tense denoting a continuous walking away from it. 